Uh, we are happy to have uh, with us Sarah Roberts from the University of uh, California, Los Angeles. Uh, it's an honor to have you, Sarah. Thank you for being here. Uh, Sarah is a pioneer a researcher because uh, at the time, uh, eight years ago, I think, when people didn't really understand how the industry of the internet worked and uh, what would be the stakes of the web uh, uh, 2.0 and the participative internet, she was one of the first uh, researchers to, to, uh, to work on moderation of uh, commercial content. Uh, we should know that each time we post a, a video, a photograph, or a link uh, online on YouTube, on Facebook, uh, if uh, we get reported about this content, well, there are some uh, uh, real people, like humans, that have to decide if this, if this post will continue to, to be online or not. This is not machines that do it. Um, and actually, the, internet, in the, uh, the industry of the internet always wants us to think that they have all these super technologies of uh, in, uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence that uh, do, uh, does this kind of work. But actually, there are humans. Uh, and these humans uh, have really difficult working conditions. They go through days on looking on sexual abuse, violence, uh, uh, racist, xenophobic uh, content. Uh, and uh, most of them are really badly paid and they have really difficult working conditions. So Sarah has studied that since a long time. She also participated in uh, documentaries about the, about the subject, uh, like uh, a documentary that was uh, primed in uh, Sundance Festival, which is called The Cleaners. Uh, and uh, she will have the opportunity now to present us to, with her research. So Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and I'd like to thank all the organizers of this event. It's really my honor to be here in, in Greece for the first time. I'm sorry to say it's the first time, but I don't think it will be the last. Uh, and I, I really appreciate the introduction, and I hope that despite the fact that I'm, I'm not coming from journalism, I hope you will see the resonance uh, of this subject for so much of what has already been discussed today, and I think we'll uh, continue to discuss over the next few days uh, because I think as as my uh, my introduction uh, indicated uh, what we're talking about is the uh, the factual components of of the production of what we uh, what we consume online and for a long time for a variety of reasons that uh, those mechanisms have been obfuscated uh, denied cloaked in other things. I think what we're going to talk about today really is artificial, artificial intelligence, uh, which is human intelligence, um, although I would argue that artificial intelligence also represents that too. I'm going to try to drive these two computers, so if I forget to advance the slide, just let me know, okay, because I'm going to do it on here. Um, but anyway, uh, so, so for the next little while, this after lunch session, I hope Everybody has had a bit of coffee along with your sandwiches. Uh, we will we'll go through and, and I will describe to you this work that I've been doing uh, for the past eight years around this topic. And it's really just a bit of an overview and then hopefully, I, will we be doing some Q&A at the end? Should I leave some time? Or we'll, see, we'll, we'll see how we, I'm, I'm gonna have to get on with it. So we'll, we'll have some Q&A. Uh, so I'm just going to start out with this slide. Uh, you know, I prepared this talk well in advance for once. I was ready to come here. And then uh, as I was leaving Los Angeles on Monday, this, uh, this situation broke, and we'll come back to it. But it, uh, you know, it, to my mind, it's just a, uh, another illustration. We'll talk about the material facts behind it. But it's just another illustration of the way in which uh, the issue of content moderation and what I call specifically commercial content moderation, which I'll define for you in a moment, has gone from uh, an obscure kind of unknown practice uh, over the past eight years to really uh, something that is um, no longer denied and is in fact constantly being invoked by social media platforms as uh, a 
vast portion of the solution, if not the, the, uh, the fundamental solution to the problems that they have managing user-generated content. And with that, of course, is, uh, is going to come some other, uh, some other situations and facts, one of which is this lawsuit that was filed on Monday. So as I was going to the airport in LA, I started getting calls from reporters and you know, I'd had the temerity to be off my phone for like two hours when this happened and they all said, have you read the lawsuit yet? And I was like, I'm in a, you know, I'm, I'm on the way to the airport, but uh, I will read it. And so I since have, and we'll talk about that. All right, so as I said, um, when I started this research in, in 2010, uh, I, I had to really explain to people what content moderation was and why it might be needed. Uh, and when I say people, I don't just mean people that might not have reason to know about it. I was in, in a PhD program at the time at the University of Illinois, uh, surrounded by you know the smartest people uh, in media studies, communication studies, and so on, information studies where I come from, and I would ask them uh, the question after I, I discovered this topic via a very small article in the New York Times in 2010, I would ask these colleagues and these professors of mine, have you ever heard of this practice of, of human beings adjudicating and deciding upon content online uh, on behalf of major social media platforms? And uh, in every single case, uh, two things happened. First they said, huh, no, I never thought of that. Fair enough, I hadn't either. And the second thing they said was, don't computers do that? And again, these were folks uh, who ought to have known better, right? So it, it, it piqued my interest because I had a sense that, you know, they weren't ignorant people who uh, had no information whatsoever. It, it, it indicated to me that there was some sort of obfuscation going on and some confusion perhaps being deliberately created about how such processes might be undertaken on these major social media platforms. And I would argue that in fact, uh, in large part, uh, those social media platforms which self-define and will tell you over and over again that they are technology companies first and foremost, have a propensity to believe that uh, the solution to just about every problem, social and otherwise, lies in a technological application of some sort. So I see uh, that invocation of, of computers solving, quote unquote, the problem of, of content adjudication as being uh, largely aspirational on behalf of the platforms. Uh, and even, you know, in 2018, leaps and, and bounds have been made around uh, the, the technological possibility of machine learning and, and artificial intelligence applications when it comes to reviewing content. But that having been said, we're talking about a workforce of tens of thousands of people, possibly in the six figures, as a matter of fact. It's a massive workforce. Um, and these are just a few of the headlines in the past, you know, in the past year or so. And I would say, of course, I, I, I come from the United States and my perspective is greatly influenced by that. So I'll be talking mostly about cases uh, of American firms and uh, sort of American political context. But as we all know, uh, those firms have great global influence and their decision making and their activities uh, influence the world. So I just want to take, uh, take us back for a moment to 2010. This is when I was, uh, again, a graduate student at the University of uh, Illinois, which is in central rural uh, Illinois. Anybody ever, anybody ever been there? We have any folks? Um, think about cornfields. That's what that is. It's uh, cornfields everywhere and, and a university sort of set in the middle of it. It's a rural agricultural part of the United States and, uh, and, and a sort of a research university that comes out of that tradition. So it was there, I was working there in the summer of 2010 as a graduate student instructor and I was reading the New York Times and there was a small, a very small story about workers who were in rural Iowa and again, if you're familiar with the geography of the, of the Midwest of the United States, you'll know that Iowa is adjacent to Illinois and is very similar culturally and economically. And these workers in rural Iowa were working in a call center. 
uh, they weren't working on family farms. Family farms had been decimated, of course, in the 1980s, and uh, agribusiness was sort of the order of the day uh, in, uh, in Iowa. So those displaced agricultural workers of a generation or two uh, were seeking other work. And in this rural part of the United States, uh, industry was not strong. There was no really manufacturing anymore to speak of. Uh, other jobs that, that did exist tended to be low wage and low status. And so it came as a surprise to me, although when I reflected upon it, I guess it made some sense, that uh, there was a call center concern located in, uh, in Iowa. Uh, I think in the American imagination as well as in that of maybe our colleagues from the UK and elsewhere, when we think about call centers and call center work, that tends to be sort of an othering notion of thinking about work that goes on somewhere else uh, in the globe, certainly not in the, uh, in the, in the US. I say this uh, facetiously, of course. But in fact, um, what these workers were doing in these call center environments were not answering phone calls. So that was a bit of a misnomer. Uh, they were working in these... Uh, in these call centers doing this uh, seemingly new form of labor, which was to review uh, a sort of a never-ending stream of user-generated content that was being uploaded to uh, platforms, unnamed platforms for the most part, but these, these people were working as outsourced third-party laborers on behalf of them. And the story reported that they were low-wage workers making between like 9.75 and $12 an hour. They didn't have benefits, as many of you may know, health care benefits in the United States are bizarrely tied to employment. We don't have nationalized health care. Uh, and it's possible to have a job where you have very poor health care or none at all. And that seemed to be the case of these people. And uh, most importantly, uh, in terms of what I was interested in, many of these, report, these workers were reporting uh, deleterious outcomes psychologically about the work that they were doing. Because what they were looking at was, in many cases, material that had already been identified by people like, like you and like me, regular users of these platforms who maybe had come across something that we found disturbing, distasteful, possibly illegal, and that we had flagged uh, for review. So here's where the humans come into the chain, because for many of us, if we've undergone those processes, has anybody here ever reported anything on a platform? I bet a few of you. You're like, I don't want to admit that. Right, some of you have done that. Um, for many people, that's sort of as far as our imagination goes. Again, I don't think that's our fault. I think the system is designed to render any activity beyond that as, as being sort of opaque and, and suggest that it's automated. But in fact, it was being routed to people uh, in the middle of a cornfield in rural Iowa. So I went to the website of this company that was identified, one of the companies that was identified in that article, and it was called Calaris. It's no longer called that. It's been sold a few times and has some other, you know, kind of meaningless made up name. I can't remember what it is right offhand, but it was Calaris at the time. And uh, I went to the website, which I have a screenshot of here, and you can see this bucolic farm scene and you know, cornfields and a red barn and silo and the, the tagline, outsourced to Iowa, not India. Yeah, I thank you for laughing. I mean, what else can you do? You laugh to not cry because, of course, the implication here, xenophobic, <laughs> racist, you know, the notion that what is being uh, purchased by, by those who would use Calaris' services is that Midwestern, corn-fed, white person probably kind of looks like yours truly, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, f kind of farm stock, right? And all of those Midwestern values that might, might go into it because in fact, uh, the people who adjudicate those content have, the content have to do it on some set of values or principles. And those, those principles are being supplied assuredly by the platforms, but this, uh, this tagline is appealing to something else, some other sense, right? And wouldn't, wouldn't American firms rather have these, these nice American workers working for a pittance and with no health care benefits doing that work than someone in India? Uh, uh, as a spoiler, I'll tell you, they also like to hire people in, in, in India to do this work, too. Um, all right. Okay. So. so that leads me to just sort of give you a, a, a working definition of commercial content moderation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a backwards, reverse-engineered 
term uh, because content moderation or the intervention and adjudication and decision making of content on this social internet, I argue, has been going on, in fact, since the social internet has existed. And by way of uh, my own bona fides, I'll say this is my 25th year as a, as a, a user of the social internet. So I was doing this I guess we can argue if it's cool now, but I was certainly uh, using the internet when it was decidedly uncool, and I was tying up phone lines with my modem and irritating my roommate and so on, and not wanting to tell people what I was doing because it was so nerdy. But even back 25 years ago, when I felt that I was a late adopter to some of those social media spaces, we, we called them uh, online communities or other terms, cyberspace, remember that one? Um, even back then, we had uh, mostly organic, uh, sort of self-organized mechanisms to intervene on our social spaces. And some spaces were known for having, uh, you know, anarchic uh, orientations to the content that they allowed online. But I would argue that that is a that is in fact a policy and a politic that is tangible. So, despite a lot of I think fantasy to the contrary that the internet is, has been a, an ungoverned and ungovernable space in terms of content, I would argue that, that actually it, it has always had, had the, uh, the uh, characteristic of, of, in the social internet anyway, of being, uh, having governance basically and having people do adjudication. What's different, what was different in 2010 and what continues to be different in 2018 is the scope and scale at which this work is undertaken and the fact that it has been organized it, it, into an industrial practice uh, or set of practices that people now do for a living and they do for money. Uh, that is actually, I would argue, a new uh, development, uh, relatively new actually. Uh, I mean, I've been looking at it for eight years and it was going before that, but in the scheme of things, it is relatively new. Um, and so I use this term commercial content moderation to designate that latter uh, expression of this, of this phenomenon where these people are doing this as a profession. They're doing this in a professional capacity. They're receiving payment for it. Uh, and it's organized on a large scale basis. And just to give you an idea of what we're talking about in terms of user generated content, and I think the minister was speaking to some of this this morning. Uh, on YouTube alone, there, there is 400 hours of video material uploaded per minute per day, 365 days a year. Uh, I always have to look that figure up if I don't have it to hand because I, I usually will say, my tendency is to say 400, uh, hours, 400 hours per hour. No, it's per minute. So the solicitation of user-generated content is vast, and in fact, it's the entire economic model of the platforms to constantly have an influx of material. Why? Because it generates viewership, it generates engagement, it generates repeat uh, activity on the platform, all of which is designed to put us in contact with or the subject of advertising, right? So the, the model of the, the firms themselves is predicated on a never-ending stream and influx of material, uh, which is largely impossible to adjudicate at the front end. And so basically they solicit all of that material to sort it out later. And I would say there, again, uh, our own free labor is invoked as we see things and sort of report out that uh, it, it's problematic in some cases. So I don't really expect you to see the detail on here. There, right, there, there'll be a quiz on this flowchart at the end. Um, the, the idea is just to show you the complexity uh, of, of these processes as rendered by Facebook itself and, and other, uh, other firms, you know, have similar kind of flowcharting approaches to decision making around the content that they allow to stand. And so paradoxically, I would say these, these commercial content moderators make decisions about the rendering of content visible, potentially on a platform, while simultaneously remaining themselves invisible 
and imperceptible. So in other words, in the world of, of commercial content moderation, the sign of doing a good job is to, uh, is to leave no trace at all of your intervention. Uh, and yet, I, I would also argue that the decision making that these workers take, uh, both at a granular level, but in aggregate, and perhaps more importantly, uh, goes fundamentally to defining the landscape of, uh, of the internet as we use it. Uh, so we can't always know that they're there and we don't know the decisions that they make, but we do receive and perceive of the outcome in terms of the material that, that is left up online. And so in this regard, these workers, to go to the title of my talk today, uh, Gatekeepers of the Internet, these workers ser serve this fundamental function of, uh, of being the mechanism by which material may be allowed to stand or may be deleted. And they do that work uh, primarily on behalf of, of the platforms. It's a, it's a function of brand p protection, first and foremost. And there are other concerns, too. There are some legal responsibilities to which these workers uh, respond on behalf of the firms. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, there, there are certain other kinds of decisions that maybe reflect uh, issues of of taste or a particular uh, tolerance for a platform for certain kinds of material over another. I mean, we know that there's, for example, a difference between 4chan and Reddit and YouTube and Facebook in terms of what we can expect to find there. And a lot of that, uh, if it's not the policies themselves, the implementation of those policies, what goes to, to make those differences uh, felt by us as users are these intermediaries who remain invisible. Uh, I would say that by and large, uh, across the board, uh, platforms that use these services and that rely on them as this fundamental mechanism for their own brand management and, uh, and sort of liability protection do not like to discuss these practices for a number of reasons. They don't like to even admit in many cases that they, that they undertake them. And up until I would say about a year and a half ago, two years ago, it would be difficult to get them on record talking about, uh, talking about even having this workforce. And they ensure that in a number of ways. Uh, one of the ways they do this is by asking these workers and asking by making these workers sign non-disclosure agreements or NDAs that preclude them from discussing the work that they do, the conditions under which they do it, the rules they follow, and so on. Um, that has some other side effects that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, so that's one way they do it. They also, as, as, I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, undertake some other mechanisms uh, to create a distance between the platforms that require this work and those who actually undertake the work. And in some cases, that has to do with, in fact, outsourcing to India, outsourcing to the Philippines, outsourcing to uh, the Global South, and pretty much being as geographically as far geographically and culturally removed as they can while still, uh, still, um, I don't know, uh, making use of other kinds of relationships. And I'll explain that a bit more. Uh, at any rate, uh, no matter what way we cut in, in on this, the, the, what is n now on the record from the firms themselves and what I've been saying for a number of years is that uh, commercial content moderation is a fundamental function and activity going on at uh, social media, mainstream social media companies. And uh, in other words, uh, they would not want to go without having this gatekeeping mechanism, having this uh, means by which they can intervene upon the user-generated content they solicit and that they then disseminate. And, uh, and yet, paradoxically, perhaps, it's uh, one of the most unknown and hidden aspects of the work, and it's certainly considered low status and, and uh, given a low wage as compared to other uh, functions in these firms. All right. Um, so just to break this down a little bit more, as I went through my research, uh, I, I discovered that uh, commercial content moderation was not a monolithic practice that looked the same wherever it was uh, taking place. And in fact, there were really four major kind of industrial sites where the work was, was uh, being undertaken. And so this is what they are, uh, just briefly. So we had the model of workers working in-house, 
at uh, at these major firms, the, the Facebooks and, and YouTubes of the world. Um, all of these places have workers who come to work every day at their headquarters or at their, uh, you know, their outposts, uh, where their branded outposts, wherever those are in the world. Uh, but often those workers, even if they come to work, say, at Google, they have a differential status of being a, a contractor and being hired in through a third party. So that's a distinction. That's not always the case, but it often is. There are boutique firms. Uh, which are, uh, which are firms that specialize in handling a, a company or a brand's social media needs soup to nuts, and this can include this uh, commercial content moderation removal activity, but it, it can also include things like uh, having people go on that Facebook page for Oreo cookie and writing something like, gosh, I just love these cookies, they're so delicious. You know, seeding content in uh, where there's an absence. Uh, and so there are, there are boutique firms that offer all those kinds of services, management of all uh, social media properties for a particular brand and so on, and this is one of the functions of that. We have call centers, uh, which I think in terms of the proportion of, of number of workers who are doing this work, we probably would see the most number of people in a call center-like arrangement. These can be found in places like Iowa, they can be found in places like Romania, Poland, uh, North Africa, I believe, uh, for the francophone uh, market. They can be found in the Philippines, in India, and so on. And th they are uh, often predicated on taking on work when another part of uh, the world might have gone to sleep. So when I was interviewing workers who were doing work in-house as contractors, they said, well, you know, when we're off our shift, our Indian team comes on. And when I asked about who that Indian team was, oh, well, they work at a call center in India. They are not actually, you know, they're not actually directly employed. And then finally, we have micro-labor websites. Uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, have we heard of that? Anybody? Amazon Mechanical Turk, yeah, of course, yeah, that's cheating. We have one plant in the audience who says I know about that. Amazon Mechanical Turk, Upwork, uh, these are micro-labor uh, websites where uh, individual workers can go on and take on a task. It's the most fractured form of this work, so people are often paid for viewing a small set of images or even one image at a time, they might get paid one cent per view in some cases. It's really digital piecework, so when we think of the piecework arrangement, that's what this is online. And so you will find commercial content moderation taking place in all of these contexts and it, everywhere around the globe. That, that having been said, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go to Silicon Valley next. Um, when I started my work in 2010, I did try to approach those workers at Calaris in, in Iowa, if for no other reason than it was close enough for me to drive there, and I was a graduate student with no funding to do a big research project, so I thought maybe I could go there and meet them. Uh, but what I found was that I couldn't get any response to my inquiries, and I had a sense that maybe after that New York Times piece, those workers were uh, told that they should probably not be speaking to people like me. So uh, I had to do a lot of uh, other stuff, which we can talk about if you're interested at some point, to find workers. Uh, it was really hard because, again, they were under this non-disclosure agreement that also had clauses like if you talk about this work, you can be fired for doing it. So uh, I had to build up some trust with, with a variety of workers through a variety of means uh, and, and kind of assure their anonymity uh, in order to interview them. But, uh, but luckily, I, I did get in touch with a group of workers who are doing this work for a major firm in Silicon Valley. And uh, uh, I call it Megatech. And, you know, Megatech, obviously that's a pseudonym. Just imagine your major social media platform of choice, and that's probably Megatech. What I've found amusing over the years is that when I've had occasion to talk to people from Silicon Valley, they all think that this is their company. Okay, <laughs> that works for me. Um, so the, the workers that I met from Megatech, they were all young people. Interestingly, they had all graduated from four-year universities, from elite universities, in fact, places like uh, Berkeley, uh, the University of Southern California, and some other liberal arts colleges. I would also add that they graduated with massive amounts of student debt. Another nod to the American, peculiar American system there. 
and um, they, they were all excellent students. That, in fact, was a precondition of them being hired by Megatech uh, to do this work, but unfortunately for them, they had chosen fields such as uh, history and English literature, probably a few journalists in the mix, uh, you know, the social sciences and, and humanities, not the STEM fields. And so they were relegated in the context of Silicon Valley to this other type of work, uh, which none of them had ever heard of before they took on, on the role at Megatech. And in fact, uh, they all had said to me that, you know, the allure of getting a job in this industry, in this Silicon Valley-based tech industry, really um, overruled any anxieties they had about what this job might entail when they first heard about it. So this is uh, just a quote from one of the workers. I can't imagine anyone who does this job and is able to just walk out at the end of their shift and just be done. You dwell on it whether you want to or not. And this was a, a refrain that I heard from so many of the workers that I've interviewed over the years, that uh, this is a, a psychologically demanding kind of work that puts you uh, in, in, the, in the front lines of viewing some of the most difficult, uh, violent, just sometimes gross, all the way to uh, uh, you know, illegal and, and harmful imagery, uh, some of the worst, of course, being child sexual exploitation, but also animal abuse, material raw footage from war zones, uh, people self-harming, uh, people abusing children in other ways, all kinds of stuff. And this is what they viewed over and over again. This is what they were doing, of course, with their degrees from Berkeley. Uh, they were working in the tech industry, but it was, uh, it was a difficult job. And, uh, you know, it was a stigmatized job even within the culture of megatech. Another worker I talked to from megatech talked about how he would take this work home with him. Um, and yet, based on that NDA and also based on just not wanting to harm others by repeating what he was seeing, he kept it inside. And that had, a, that had an impact on him. Uh, he described his work as being in a hole of filth, uh, that, that he wanted to sort of uh, uh, triage from the rest of his life, but it's very difficult to do that with, with this kind of psychological work. It's hard to compartmentalize it, and even that has its own uh, implications and repercussions. So, uh, you know, they, these workers were expressing to me that uh, on the one hand, they were good at their jobs and they, they had a real sense of altruism around what they were doing, um, saying things to me like, you wouldn't want to be on an internet if we didn't, if, without this work, if we didn't do this work. You couldn't handle it, which I believe is true. I know that I personally couldn't. Um, uh, you, you can't imagine the kind of thing we take on and I'm good at doing that. And, you know, I wasn't in a position to argue, but then one of, the, uh, one of the guys that I was interviewing from Megatech told me, a few minutes after telling me he had no uh, ill effects from this work, he said, you know, a few n nights ago I was sitting at home with my partner and she kind of got close to me and wanted to be intimate and got close to me on the couch and, and moved in and I just pushed her away. I pushed her away and I didn't know how to tell her. It was because I had an image flash in my mind of something I'd seen at work and I didn't even want to tell her what that was. So uh, a, another worker told me, you know, since I started this job, I've been drinking a lot or I've been avoiding social situations because when I go out with friends, we, we all talk about our jobs and I don't want to talk about it. So these effects were, were uh, not always even evident to the workers themselves or they were in somewhat of a, of a situation of denial around this. And yet, uh, in the context of, of uh, the American labor marketplace in 2010, 2012, 2015, uh, these workers often expressed to me a, a feeling of, of gratitude that they were employed, uh, a happiness that they had a way to make a living even though it seemed to be at the expense of, uh, of their well-being in other ways. And I would certainly say that for me too, I, you know, I, I had to take these stories and put it against the, the backdrop of of, uh, of what I had learned and known about the kind of uh, deliverance from harm that, uh, that this kind of analytic and computational work was supposed to offer, and yet here was a case where it seemed to be quite the opposite. I mean, wasn't it supposed to look like this? Right? We'd all be sitting in that clean server room in a nice pencil skirt. I don't know. 
anyway. So, of course, when we're thinking about the Knowledge Society, we're thinking about people like Daniel Bell and theorists from the early 1970s who had this aspirational and, and uh, 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 largely uh, positive vision towards a new socioeconomic paradigm that would uh, deliver people from the, the physical strain and dangers of the shop floor. Uh, that people would rely on their uh, analytical and cognitive skills to do work, that they would, uh, they would find their work uh, in, the, in these technical jobs and in the, in the technical sector as specialists and uh, doing uh, scientific or engineering work or managing information and data. And, uh, and that this would, uh, you know, really basically take us I'm sorry, these, these jokes are difficult to land when I have to lean over and do this. But anyway, it would take us here, right? This is what we would end up having through these new forms of work, which were large, largely predicated on uh, technological innovation, would be more leisure time, which we all absolutely have, right? Okay, the, no, we do not, I would say. Uh, in fact, um, you know, I'm in Greece. I don't really need to lecture at Greek scholars about neoliberalism, you know what I mean? Like, that's what everybody's talking about. Um, but I, I would argue that in, instead of, of this promised deliverance, what we're seeing is an uberization of, uh, of society and, and certainly of, of the uh, labor economy in the United States at the very least. And this uh, work form of commercial content moderation is absolutely based on so many of these factors. And Silicon Valley, of course, is a great proponent of so many of these structures, things like taking workers and making them all into contract laborers and making their work uh, precarious, deregulation schemes uh, that avoid existing re uh, regulation and absolutely uh, lobby to preclude new ones, tax avoidance, the use of public, uh, public infrastructure for private gain, uh, other kinds of disruption. I heard in the panel uh, before lunch so many references to Airbnb, so I could have called it the Airbnbization of the economy as well. That would have been another great example. But certainly in San, Fran San Francisco, uh, where these workers were based that I interviewed from Megatech, uh, they were making $48,000 a year uh, gross, pre-tax, one of the most expensive cities in the world. Um, they had several roommates, right? All of these people were living with like five others. And this is just a shot of a, of a Google bus uh, at, a, at a public bus stop in San Francisco picking up workers to take them down to, uh, to Silicon Valley to do this work. So again, all, all this work is being done against a, a backdrop of uh, enormous geospatial, economic, and political reconfigurations. Uh, that have taken place, all of which lead to uh, the obfuscation of all kinds of uh, material and immaterial labor underpinning uh, the knowledge economy and the internet specifically, uh, often via outsourcing and, and human migration in particular. Uh, these reconfigurations may take the form of so-called special economic zones. We know about those, um, particularly in East Asia, where terms are favorable for these transnational corporations to outsource their labor. And uh, the countries that host that labor and, the, and those, uh, those multinationals take advantage of that and treat these zones as being different entities and there are you know, favorable tax arrangements and other kinds of uh, infrastructural uh, setups such as uh, weak labor laws and so on that make this very attractive to these, these major corporations. And that of course is the case in the Philippines. The Philippines, uh, for the United States market in particular, in the North American market, is, uh, you know, is probably the most important outsourcing site of labor, and uh, particularly of knowledge labor, of service sector labor, uh, and of call center labor. And this is where much of the commercial content moderation labor is, is going from the United States. Uh, in fact, uh, it's about one-tenth the size of the population of India, and yet it, it surpassed India as being the call, call center capital of the globe a number of years ago. And I don't mean per capita, I just mean raw numbers. So I visited the Philippines a few years ago, a few summers ago, to uh, talk to workers there, uh, workers very much like the megatech employees, and I'll just give you a few highlights of, of that. Um, but before I do, 
you know, just again to speaking to, to the, uh, the sort of the, the government arrangements that facilitate this kind of work, the, Phil the Philippines has an entire ministry dedicated to the solicitation and, and, uh, and uh, infrastructural needs of, of these multinationals who bring their work to the Philippines. It's called PESA. And this is from a slide deck that they had online. Again, you know, as a researcher, you find that kind of material and it's just, it's fascinating. And here's some of the things that PESA had to say about uh, Filipino uh, labor and why another uh, company might want to outsource there from another part of the world. Only three strikes in nine years being one of the points that it touts. So very low organized labor is something that it is, uh, it is using as a selling point effectively. And the Philippines at, at, at present has over 300 of these special economic zones with a, a healthy portion of them being IT special economic zones. This kind of uh, economic and uh, infrastructural development has led to really uneven growth in the Philippines and particularly in the Manila uh, metro district. And so you have some places that look like this. This is um, the Bonifacio uh, Global City or BGC, which used to be a military base called Fort McKinley, where the United States Army was uh, stationed for many years uh, when it occupied the Philippines. And then you have other parts of the country that look like this, and I call this the paperless office. Okay, this is where technology goes to die. Um, uh, it, you know, the garbage is put on a barge and sent to the Philippines uh, for dismantling from other parts of the world, uh, an analogy that I draw to the outsourcing of the, uh, the digital garbage that commercial content moderators view. So, uh, you know, just to, just to drive the point home, here's a map from 1923 of trade routes to and from the Philippines uh, with, the, with the United States as the point of origin for much of it. And I couldn't help but noticing when I saw this map the ways in which this digital uh, refuse also flows on these same channels. So the point being that uh, the American relationship, the North American relationship with the Philippines uh, in terms of outsourcing the garbage work of, of viewing online content, it's, you know, it may seem new, but there are some very old precedents for this kind of relationship. Uh, and in fact, you can see that in, in the ways in which those firms are soliciting the labor. This is a company called uh, Microsourcing that is a call center in the Philippines and does quite a lot of specialist work uh, for commercial content moderation. At the top, you'll see that this is a banner from their website where they, they tell us that Filipinos have excellent language skills, understand Western slang, and have a great eye for detail. Yes, 300 million people have a great eye for detail, all of them, uh, making them perfectly suited for content moderation work. So yes, why do Filipino people have a great understanding of Western slang? It's sort of um, not stated there that it has to do with uh, political, economic, military, and cultural dominance of the United States for a century. And then on the bottom, they offer a service called Virtual Captives, where you can quickly shore up a, a team uh, as, as your labor need uh, uh, presents itself, and you can just as quickly uh, scale down from that team and really have no further responsibility to them. And that's a kind of a US-facing um, solicitation. So what we see uh, in the Philippines, but elsewhere as well, in the United States to be sure, uh, are, are these intertwined systems that go to creating the conditions that, uh, that, that make it possible to have these kinds of labor practices. Uh, these are some of them. I'm sure this is not an exhaustive list, but state and governmental policy regimes, land and physical infrastructure development. So again, these specialized uh, uh, economic zones in the Philippines, all of which have uh, 24 by seven uninterrupted power, high speed internet, skyscrapers, uh, every you know, multinational clothing chain you want, all of that. And then 
perhaps most import importantly, the availability of the labor pool, a labor pool that would be willing to do this work, a labor pool that would do it under these conditions of low pay and low status and precarity of the work. And uh, um, in the case of the Philippines, a, a huge uh, proportion of young people who are looking for work in what appears to be a professional sector. But that, of course, again, was the case for the workers in, in Megatech and Silicon Valley, too. And just a couple reflections from these workers uh, in the Philippines. They were really aware of the precarity of the work, not just at their own personal level, but at the level of the contracting company for which they were working. Uh, John, who's 23, pointed out that um, you know, his work in the BPO was, was precarious and any time that he was found to uh, fall short of either productivity metrics or quality of his decisions, he could be let go without warning. And uh, his colleague Drake, who was one of the, the oldest workers that I spoke to at 29, uh, pointed out that it's, it's, this is not an easy job and there's always this uh, backdrop again of being, being fired for errors. And to give you an idea of the kind of uh, productivity metrics we're talking about, 10 to 15 seconds to make a decision about whether a piece of content should stay or not. As this uh, worker, John, pointed out, they used to have over 30 seconds to make that decision. It was cut down to 15, 10 to 15 seconds, which is another way of saying the amount of productivity that they had to uh, undergo increased exponentially. And of course, Part of the reason for this, part of the reason for this was a constant threat that their contract would be uh, rescinded and go to someplace like India, where uh, another contracting company would underbid, uh, either by claiming that they could produce more, or they could uh, they could offer lower wages. I think I got to wrap it up here. Right, We're just a few minutes left. Anyone? Okay. Anyway, so I talked a lot about the conditions of the workers, but I think, uh, you know, there's a lot that we could say and there's a lot more to talk about here. And certainly one of the biggest pieces of, of the puzzle here is understanding the ways in which these decisions that are rendered granularly and, and rendered on a piece-by-piece -piece basis, basis almost to the point of absurdity. You know, it's like the film Brazil. It's like you know, ridiculous bureaucracy, right? Um, the ways in which those decisions in aggregate actually constitute a particular kind of politics. And we can look at those decisions if we could only access them. If we could look at those decisions and understand them, we could backtrack and understand something about the political orientation of these platforms, most of which claim that they are. Anyone? Yeah, thank you. You're with me. Yes, they claim they're neutral. And they, they benefit from that claim in a number of ways. Uh, they benefit, benefit from that uh, just by uh, the, the way in which they can then solicit all of our participation, but of course from a regulatory standpoint they benefit too by claiming neutrality, and I think that's a fundamental thing. But all of these things combine this granularity, this examination of content piece by piece, decontextualized in a matter of seconds by someone somewhere else in the world who's maybe 23 years old um, and not steeped in, for example, the controversy of uh, uh, American imperialism or something like that. All of that leads to absurdities, and it leads to absurdities like the classification of this, uh, this image called the terror of war, uh, a very important image from the Vietnam War era that actually many argue turned the tide of American, uh, American perceptions of that war uh, to, to anti-war. Uh, this was taken down on Facebook many, many times, but in particular, oh, very uh, famously, uh, about a year and a half ago when a Norwegian journalist posted it, and he kept reposting and reposting, and it kept being removed and removed on the grounds of child nudity, okay? Now, I would argue this is obscene, but not for those reasons. <laughs> this is obscene because this is a child burned uh, in a war of uh, imperialism, right? That's obscene to me, but those aren't the politics of Facebook. And in fact, uh, I would say those politics reify uh, state power. All right. Do we have any German colleagues in the audience? 
I know we had some on site. Anybody speaking German, you can give that a shot, but I'm going to call it Nets, <laughs> Nets DG. So there are all sorts of uh, new regulations coming out that are putting pressure on the companies. Now, most of them are coming from the European context, and this is one law. Do you, do you folks know about this law? Yes, so this says, this is, this is basically forcing social media companies to adhere to German law around hate speech, which is very specific and, and very, uh, very, very serious in the German context. And so the response by the companies is to, of course, hire more workers, right? So this propensity towards more regulation has, uh, has an output of, uh, of, of increasing the number of people who are going to do this work. I'm, I'm not here to argue that German law shouldn't be followed. I, I'd actually say that I find it important that uh, something other than the de facto uh, cultural and legal context of the United States be represented online. And what we have with American companies dominating the space is a, is a hegemony of, of American ideology that goes uh, unacknowledged in most cases. But uh, lately, the, the tide has turned, and the answer to just about every criticism and every new bit of regulation is let's hire more people. And they're being hired, not under some amazing new circumstances, but under the same old ones that I was talking about. But uh, the stakes are high for these firms. And meanwhile, another solution was to limit workers to only four hours a day instead of eight hours a day of reviewing this content. That was YouTube's great idea, which does what, ultimately? Oh, that too. But I would say it doubles the number of people doing this work right, effectively, because they're doing nothing to mitigate the flow of user-generated content, right? That's actually the oil, the gold that's coming into the platform, so that's never on the table. And again, that's an ideological orientation to how they do the work that they do. Let's just keep bringing in content without, uh, without and you know, can we talk about the word content too? Like this meaningless idea of content where everything is rendered flat and meaningless, it's all the same, the terror of war, a picture of a cat, Somebody ranting, it's all the same content, right? All right. Google, also in the game, hiring 10,000 new people. And finally, last, but certainly not least, the American tradition of suing. We've got lawsuits. The first one was filed in December of 2016 in the state of Washington. Uh, that has yet to be resolved. And what I find most interesting about it, uh, to my knowledge, it's the first one of its kind, it's certainly in the American context. What I find most interesting about it is that the workers at Microsoft were actually full-on direct Microsoft employees. They were not contractors. And the reason they weren't is because Microsoft got its pants suit off it in around 2000 for constantly hiring people called contractors that were actually lifetime employees. So they really don't have this huge contractor pool in the same way some of the other organizations do. Uh, they had two workers say, you know, you had us for 10 years from 2007 to about 2016-15 looking at child sexual exploitation material, among other material, and we have PTSD and we're permanently disabled. That lawsuit is ongoing. Um, I mean, if I were asked by someone in the industry, I would probably take more than asking me. If I had a reason to counsel them, I would have said, you better call your buddies at Microsoft and tell them to settle this case. And here's why, because there's tens of thousands of other people who can make these claims. And you don't want them to get that bright idea, do you? But, you know, and we don't know how much of this has actually already been settled in arbitration or mediation. It's possible that there have been many other cases, but of course they're all under non-disclosure, so we wouldn't know. But what was important about this was it was public. Um, I actually answered the phone one day. I was in my office at work. I don't even know the phone number to that landline phone. I never give it out, but it rang and I answered it, which was stupid on my part. And this person started talking and asking me all these questions about worker well-being. And I said, I'm sorry, who, who are you? Where are you calling from? And she gave her name and then she said, I'm lead counsel for Microsoft. <laughs> I said, Goodbye. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you, click. <laughs> And then here we come back to where we started, which is the Facebook lawsuit that was filed this Monday. So you're getting hot off the press news here. Um, again, I don't know why those folks weren't calling their, their buddies. The general counsels weren't calling each other and telling them to settle that case and do it quickly. But I think we're just going to see more of this. 
All right, this is actually it, my last slide. I'm mostly on time, too. Um, you know, this, again, non-exhaustive list. What is at stake? So many things, and I think you could add so many things to the list based on the conversations that's at this conference and your own uh, disciplinary and, and professional orientation to journalism. But certainly, what I want you to know are these things when you think about this, that this is a central mission-critical activity for these platforms, uh, these, these people serving as intermediaries and arbiters and decision makers are key, and yet they are treated with low status, low wage, they're often hidden, um, they work on behalf of the companies primarily, right? They are basically undertaking editorial practice by another name, without any of the power, without any of the ethical support, without any of the professionalization. This, the existence of this kind of work relies upon new and problematic labor forms. Uh, it's globalized, outsourced, precarious in, in nature. It pr puts workers in difficult and even dangerous working conditions to the point of alleging um, that they've been rendered disabled. And of course, it troubles the notion of the internet as a free speech zone, as a relationship of user to platform to world. We have to know that because we have to understand uh, the implications of our engagement online. We may ultimately decide to continue to be online, but we have to do that in an informed way and understand the production that goes into these spaces. It's very much not the public square. It's very much like a shopping mall where you're fine as long as you behave, and if you don't, you'll be trespassed, right? We need to understand these spaces as private, as commercial, as responding to shareholders, as responding to their own revenue generation and advertisers who are their actual customers. And this, I would argue, is a key mechanism by which we can do that. So I will end with this slide. This is a slide from the Philippines. This is from Eastwood City, which is a special economic zone uh, in, in the Philippines, um, an IT special economic zone. It's actually the first one. And uh, this is a bit of corporate art. I went through Eastwood City. I was looking for this statue, and I found it. And I was taking pictures of it. And a lot of the, the local people who were in the area were kind of looking at me like, does she know we have actual art museums in Manila? Like, why is she taking pictures of this? you know, awful corporate art. But this is actually, uh, if, if you can see the detail, on each one of these figures, these faceless figures, there's a headset. And they represent the uh, business process outsourcing or call center workers in the Philippines. And there's a plaque on the bottom that reads, this sculpture is dedicated to the men and women that have found purpose and passion in the business process outsourcing industry. Their commitment to service is the lifeblood of the lifeblood of Eastwood City, the birthplace of the BPO industry in the Philippines. This is the Philippines' first special economic zone dedicated to information technology, Eastwood City's modern heroes. And so uh, I would just leave you with that. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, please, let's talk about these, these workers in the light. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation, which places the, the, the question of content moderation that is particularly interesting for me in the, the context of the global uh, political economy. It's not just people doing stuff on the internet, it's related to the whole uh, functioning of the system. So we're uh, a little bit late, but we can have some, com some questions. So. Everyone, anyone wants to ask something? And I'm or? also just happy to talk to people later if we, I don't want to hold <laughs> of it Of course. Up. We have any questions? Yes? Um, that was really eye-opening for me. I mean, and, and the reason is because my impression from the media is that what you have is you have these um, um, platform companies that are there and they just say, we're just here to let people express themselves. And so the impression I come away with from the media is that it's always like, Western governments and other people are always coming down these, um, you know, megatech companies to do more to monitor the um, their platforms. But what you're saying is the opposite. So what I'm wondering is, <clears throat> why do these companies not come out and say, "Wait, we're doing so much"? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I truncated this a little bit, but uh, but. You know, there's the, if we think about the regulatory regime that governs these companies, that would be you know, the American one in the context of Facebook, Twitter, Google, and so on. And the primary uh, sort of operational regulation 
uh, is, is the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, which does two things. It, it allows firms to not be held liable for what they disseminate over their platforms, but it also gives them the discretion about when to intervene. And it's a very powerful tool, and it you know, comes from 1996, and it was destined towards internet service providers, ISPs, which is a thing my students don't even know was a thing. They don't know that you needed an ISP. I would argue that Facebook is not an ISP. It's something very different. Here's where I diverge with my colleagues um, in kind of the internet freedom zone who are, you know, come down on, on that uh, irrespective of sort of on the ground situations. So I think the reason why there is a, a less than accurate picture about there, that is a couple reasons. One is because they don't want to have to be accountable in this way. What is, is ending up happening is that they are spending all their time and resources having to redirect towards content moderation in the first place. And it could be worse if they have to be accountable for those decisions, but that's what a lot of people are asking for, and governments are starting to ask for that. So we'll see what happens. That's the first reason. But I think the second is a little uh, a less, uh, uh, you know, pragmatic. It's a little more uh, elusive. And I would say it has to do with an ideology, a certain ideological orientation to what the internet is supposed to be, which does say that it is supposed to be a place where censorship is treated as a bug and routed around, or where you're supposed to be able to express yourself without any, um, you know, anyone superseding that. And I think these companies, on the one hand, m many of the people involved in them do believe that that's the ideal and they adhere to that. But secondly, more pragmatically, there's money to be made in that particular uh, <laughs> stance. And so saying to folks, um, do you want to come on our platform and express yourself? You know, you YouTube used to say broadcast to the world. Wasn't that their slogan? How about broadcast to the world, but we might take you down if we think you're violating our terms of service and also if you're not tasteful and also if your government says we should. I'm like, right? So one of those is more appealing. Uh, uh, a quick question about the process of actual uh, Facebook, uh, let's say, censorship. I'm asking this because recently we've seen that uh, in Latin America, uh, on twice, two relatively large uh, sites, Telesur English and Venezuela Analysis, were temporarily uh, shut down by Facebook, temporarily for like a few days, but they were. On the other hand, there are numerous reports of, uh, of people that are involved in the Bolsonaro campaign, the far-right candidate in Brazil, who are really engaged in truly hateful and uh, speech and death threats, and nothing has been done about them. So who makes these calls? Who, who decides that, oh, Telesur English, which is a reputable news organization, is, something, is somebody who might be actually uh, infringing on the rules that we have set, while, while uh, hate speech and uh, vi pro-violence campaigns are not at all, uh, uh, and are, are never, uh, are always allowed to continue. So, thank you for the question. We had our colleague from Palestine talking last night about the case, similar cases of news organizations or other uh, entities with a variety of official statuses being uh, unavailable, rendered unavailable on Facebook, and we know that that has a huge impact uh, given the 2.2 billion people who use Facebook. Uh, I would say decisions like that about um, a major site is likely happening at a higher level. So typically in these organizations, they all do things sort of a bit differently, but by and large they share some commonalities, which is that they have this large pool of implementers of policy but they have full-time employees at a higher level, non-contractors, people who are really part of the company culture, who, who develop the policy to be implemented. And as you can imagine, the policies are dynamic and they're very, very responsive to a fault, I would say, to uh, pressures, governmental pressures, other kinds of pressures. And you know, here again is where Facebook and other companies like it in the American context are often acting as proxies of American interests, I would argue too, right? So I think we have to start tracing some of those things, despite if those of you who follow American politics may know that there's a whole 
um, outcry right now from the, the right wing government that social media is somehow biased against conservatives. Um, so there's also a perception that that's the case. I would say that's absurd actually, and my evidence for that is that Trump is on Twitter doing and saying whatever he wants at any time. But um, so, so decisions about, about that, like kind of those higher order decisions are usually happening um, at a higher level, which is really uh, worrisome actually, right? I mean, that's of, of great concern, especially when you start tracing how those seem to be uh, reactive to geopolitics, right? Yeah. <laughs> this lady up here? Oh, in the back. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not really a question, but it's a quick reaction. You, I was struck by the fact that you said that uh, these workers are very secretive. They have to sign uh, something to not uh, speak about their job. But I wanted to react. I, I went to uh, the Silicon Valley to do some field work. I wanted to ask how journalists in this kind of megatech companies were, uh, were enrolled in doing some um, work, journalism, journalism work, and the first thing you have to do when you enter those companies is to sign uh, um, uh, a message that said that you won't say anything of what you say. So what about this secrecy? Is it, uh, on the long term, is it possible for them to, to go home? Yeah, um, so I think your point is, uh, is a good one, that um, there is a culture of secrecy across the board in these firms. It's just like an orientation to constantly treating everything like some kind of trade secret, including just a normal meeting, you know? And I've been asked to take phone calls where I was supposed to sign an NDA just to get on the phone, and I was like, come on, like, I'm not doing that. You guys are ridiculous. And they're like, well, that's just our practice. Well save it, okay? But yeah, so I think, you know, um, first of all, I want to acknowledge the work of journalists in exposing this, this situation. I have partnered over the years with many journalists who have uh, really put pressure on the firms to cough up some of this information. Um, and, uh, you know, despite all of this, this like regime of secrecy, Workers and others, uh, former workers often, are willing to speak because, um, you know, they feel a moral uh, obligation to talk more openly and honestly about some of these things. So we're also indebted to them. And when I first started this research, uh, you know, I was really worried that I wasn't going to have access to these firms by walking in the front door. This, I was a young researcher, you know, my first big research project. And I really felt sort of like um, not legitimate for not being able to do that. But what I found was, in fact, I would never have gotten this information if I had asked, you know, uh, straight up. I would have gotten some PR, I would have gotten some baloney. And, uh, and so I think, you know, part of the thing that we need to continue to do as journalists, as researchers, as academics, as adv advocates, is to, um, go through other channels and find other ways to connect beyond that front door, especially like you said, you just walk in and you have to sign an NDA. What's that? Yeah, it's a bit very difficult. So those who preach transparency for the others are practicing opacity inside oh, for the, sure. the organizations. Yes, yeah, logic of opacity is what I call the, the, the operating mode there, yeah. Okay, so we're, re we're late, so we will maybe have time for two small questions or remarks, please. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Sharmini Pires from the Real News Network. Um, I want to question the term content moderation. Yes, please do. <laughs> um, I mean, we used to call this censorship. Yeah. Um, and when the government censored it, the Ministry of Censorship uh, did it. And with the internet and the shifts to the corporate responsibility of censoring, um, is sold to us and made acceptable by constantly throwing pornography or child sexual exploitation online uh, in the way to allow uh, corporations to actually moderate. So hence we have this um, issue of Venezuela analysis. There was no reason to take down Venezuela analysis. It doesn't make sense. The only, uh, and Telesuro, which is perhaps the only alternative forms of information we get in the English world 
um, from uh, on the internet. So certain things are unexplainable. And then as a journalist uh, and an editor, um, our work is being edited by somebody right. we don't even know, right? right? Uh, and uh, and this goes, um, you know, our editorial position at the Real News is whether it's the war in Iraq or the war in Yemen, you know, we want people to see what's going on. So yes, we will put some risky content uh, and visuals and JPEGs and so on so that people do see what's going on and footage sometimes that we get from local sources up that Facebook and YouTube and uh, others don't want people to see. Right. So often they get flagged, our stories get down. We appeal every one of them because we are consciously putting that up out there. And sometimes, uh, I mean, we don't know who it is, but sometimes they will take it down. So how much of that kind of censorship is going on versus uh, corporate proprietary going on? Like, you know, you're using somebody else's uh, Content right, right. and yeah, you, you don't somehow have, violated yeah, right. by stealing their Which of course is, you know, a whole other ball of wax in terms of the de facto enforcement of copyright rules that may or may not apply, right? How do you agitate for your fair use rights when it just gets taken down? So I think what I would say, first of all, is just um, you know, what we have to do is step back and look at the superstructure. Uh, and and one of the problems that you're describing comes from the uh, you know, essentially the encapsulation and the enclosure of journalistic practice and other kinds of informational practices in the context of these commercial platforms that dictate terms based on contracts. And that, you know, we know a regime of contracts tends to lessen rights. It doesn't expand them, it shrinks them. So part of the problem here is that, um, uh, the media outlets of the world and the citizens of the world have been rendered into users into these ecosystems over which they have very little control. And I don't, you know, am I here to say don't use Facebook ever again? It's hard for me to argue to you coming from the real news that you should avoid where 2.2 billion users are that you're trying to reach. But I want to point that out as part of the problem. And, uh, you know, in, in my work, uh, I, I am in an adjacent field, which is that of information studies where we train librarians and other kinds of information professionals. And I, I see a lot of synergies and resonance with journalism in the way that um, these are people who are trying to be informational intermediaries and guides for others to explain, to elucidate information, to find good sources, to help them understand. And you know what these platforms have done is really uh, flatten all of those relationships and sort of remove the nuance. And you can see there are, there are practical reasons why that is happening when you have 10 seconds to make a decision about something. There's no deep thought going on. So that's the first thing. Um, but I think, you know, more importantly, these are ecosystems that are not predicated on the same values and ethics and goals and uh, uh, orientation towards the public in the way that journalism is, in the way that librarianship is, in the way that other uh, uh, professions and other institutions that have not coincidentally been completely denigrated and decimated at the same time that we see the rise of social media, uh, you know, in the same ways that they do. So I've had a chance to be in front of some pretty significant people in the social media industry where I've said to them, you know, perhaps you guys who created this problem are not the best ones to solve it. Why don't you give some money to shore up public librarianship? And they were like, no. <laughs> but I tried, right? Because I think, you know, the problem here is a shrinking of institutions and a shrinking of options. Um, where do you go if your Facebook page gets shut down? What do you do? What are you, what's your recourse? To whom do you appeal? Uh, and so uh, just to go back to the, you know, the initial comment you made, I would say, you know, one way to look at this is censorship. Another way we might frame it is a, as editorial practice or cur curation. But in any case, there's no recourse. There's no way to, um, to gain understanding or make a complaint or um, ask for a review. And isn't it worrisome that you have to do that at all? 
So I think we have a bigger problem here around our informational ecosystem around the world for people, where we have this shrinking and conglomeration. We've seen that media conglomeration for decades. But this is particularly acute and frightening, right? And we see it has real world consequences. Think about the people, the Rohingya people in, in Myanmar being massacred, um, you know, predicated on information that's just flat out false and derogatory. That's just one example. So it's a real mess, isn't it? <laughs> it's a mess, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for Thank your you. speech. It was great. Thank you. Before, before we close this session, uh, the Vice President of the Council of the Open University of Cyprus would like to give a small gift to our keynote speaker.